Muy bien. Bueno, eh, bienvenidos a todos, a todas. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, this is a, a very special time because both Nathan and I are here co-hosting this event. Estamos aquí los dos anfitriones. Entonces, este, es una dicha eh, tener esta sesión de seminario sobre el tema de género eh, en la historia del catolicismo en México. Eh, tendremos a dos ponentes, eh, Divina Rosario Balbuena Castro y a Cristina Boylan, al igual que nuestra comentarista, la doctora Elizabeth Sejudo Ramos. Entonces, iniciaremos. Primero vamos a, a presentar a nuestras ponentes y después este, da, daremos entre 15 y 20 minutos para cada presentación. Después haremos el comentario y al final será la sesión de preguntas. Um, a ver, bueno, eh, Divina Rosario Balbuena Castro es eh, licenciada en educación preescolar en la normal número 3 de Nezahualcóyotl. Es maestra en Historia de México en la Universidad Latinoamericana y actualmente es estudiante de la maestría en Teología y Mundo Contemporáneo en la Universidad Iberoamericana. Adelante pues, eh, Divina, estamos aquí atentos. Escuchamos tu presentación. Gracias. Ah, hola, gracias. Muchas gracias. Gracias por, por el interés de estar aquí conmigo. Y bueno, pues bueno. Vamos, eh, ¿sí se ve mi presentación? ¿Se observa? Sí. Vale. Oh, no, está viendo. Yo todavía no la veo. ¿Sí? No. ¿No? No. Ahí, ahí va otra vez. ¿Se observa? Sí. Vale. Bueno, el título de la investigación es el manual de las hijas de María Inmaculada en la educación de las mujeres en la guerra cristera este, esta congregación inició bueno viene desde la historia de San Vicente de Paul que fue precursor del trabajo social en Francia y él es quien fundó la, pues, las hijas de, de la caridad. Y en 1844 llegan a la República Mexicana. También Santa Luisa de Marilac fue la que fundó es, esta asociación, que son las hijas de María Inmaculada y la Medalla Milagrosa. De este lado tenemos a, pues, una imagen de San Vicente. Y del lado derecho tenemos a Santa Lucía de Marilac. Bueno, estos son, eh, son las imágenes de los boletines. Eh, he investigado diferentes boletines, sobre todo eh, de 1800, bueno, de 1845 de 1900, 1934 y 1956. Eh, en Francia eh, fue el país donde se daban las órdenes para que fuera editado y promovido a la República Mexicana. Bueno, entre, bueno, en esta, en estas imágenes, de izquierda a derecha observamos la primera portada del manual de las hijas de María Inmaculada eh, en la imagen de en medio manual de las hijas de María Inmaculada este, asociación erigidas de la, en la República Mexicana y ese es el boletín eh, más bien perdón esa es la imagen de 1934 y uno de, de los temas que, bueno, que, que es significativo en el manual es vida interior de la asociación, donde están los reglamentos y las prácticas que deben de, ser, que deben de hacer las mujeres. Esta, estas imágenes es el boletín, eh, perdóname. Es el, perdónenme, es el manual de las hijas de María Inmaculada. Y este manual es de la edición de 1948. 
como les había dicho, todas las ediciones se realizaban en Francia y ya en Francia, bueno, ya se editaban en Francia y ya se promovían o se, um, no sé, pro, bueno, se promovían las palabras del, molet, del boletín, los reglamentos, las responsabilidades, pero también se repartían, más bien se repartían en los diferentes pa países donde estaban las hijas de María Inmaculada. En otra parte, Parece que perdimos... Sí, parece que perdimos la conexión. Uh -huh. eh, muy bien, vamos a esperar eh, unos minutos eh, a ver si eh, sabemos algo de Divina. Eh, no sé, Nathan, si tú le quieres escribir. Sí, lo voy a hacer. Ok, gracias. Ya viene, ahorita. Divina, ¿estás ahí? Divina. Veo que ya entró, pero no, no sé si nos escucha. Si no funciona en unos minutos, podemos cambiar a Cristina. Oh. Sí. Tal vez podamos... este Continuar con la presentación de Cristina y ya si Devina está lista, entonces ya eh, otra vez regresaremos a, a su presentación. Sí. Yo voy a darle una o dos más minutos para ver si puede conectar. Sí, vamos a hacer un minuto. Vamos a hacer un minuto. Y luego podemos ir después de eso. Parece que ya, it looks like she's um, on her way. She can hear us. Y ya está compartiendo su pantalla también. Ya estamos viendo tu pantalla. Eh, solamente necesitas compartir tu presentación. Ya, ya podemos ver la pantalla, ya estás en la, en la junta, en la sesión. Lo único es que no podemos escucharte. Uf, parece que perdimos otra vez la conexión. Um, Nathan, we could just go ahead and start with Cristina. Sí, entonces seguimos con Cristina. Si está bien con ustedes. Sí. Oh, ok. Entonces, este es un evento bilingüe. Entonces, vamos a seguir con Cristina Boylan. 
Christina A. Boylan received the Doctor in Philosophy in Modern Latin American History from the University of Oxford in 2001. She is an Associate Professor of History and a faculty member in the Interdisciplinary Studies uh, Department of the State University of New York Polytechnic Institute, where she continues to work on the history of Catholic women's activism in revolutionary Mexico, as well as food, gardening, assistive technology, humanitarian engineering, and creative learning projects with colleagues, students, and the local community. Relevant publications on Mexico include, quote, Gendering the Faith in Altering the Nation, the Union Femenina Católica Mexicana in Rev Women's Revolutionary and Religious Ex Experiences, 1917-1940, end quote, a chapter in Sex and Revolution, Gender Politics and Power in Modern Mexico, edited by Gabriela Cano, Jocelyn Olcott, and Mary Kay Vaughn, published in 2009. And most recently, she has co-authored Building Convivial Educational Tools in the 21st Century with Anna Hofre and Ibrahim Yusel in Rosa Bruno Hofre and John Igelmo Zaldivar, editors, Pablo, Pablo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and even Elisha's The Schooling Society 50 Years After, forthcoming from the University of Toronto Press, a version of which has been published in Spanish. She is currently working on two regional historical projects with co-author Gregory Swedberg of Manhattanville College, quote, when the sex of the martyr matters, Leonardo Leonor Sanchez, worker culture, Catholic activism, and state responses in Orizaba, Veracruz, Mexico, 1937, and quote, recently presented at the American Historical Association two, 2023 annual meeting, and is currently working with case studies from the Archdiocese of Guadalajara and Jalisco State, among them the focus of this presentation. The, the Zoom room is yours, Christina. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And Davina, I hope that we'll go backwards in chronological order, but that we'll be able to return to your presentation. Um, let me make this bigger. Okay. Right, well, many thanks again for the invitation and les pido su perdón, pero es así de los finales del día aquí en los Estados Unidos. Tengo algo de cansancio, así voy a seguir en inglés, pero espero poder participar en la plática um, en castellano, uh, si, me, um, si me comunique bien. <laughs> okay, um, so what I am interested in, and I'm going to use a few images to summarize here, is trying to uh, research and demonstrate the, the actual on the ground, you know, um, impact of Catholic activism in post-revolutionary Mexico and the um, contributions of women in particular have fascinated me for a long time since I was um, an undergraduate um, at, at Appalachian State University in North Carolina, challenged by my mentor and still my friend uh, Jeffrey Bortz to try to, um, to justify or explain, you know, how um, you know, Catholic women could be so benighted as to you know, um, continue protesting, um, you know, for their beliefs when the Mexican Revolution offered them so many alternatives. And well, you know, 25 years later, um, here we are still digging into the very complex details of what the Mexican revolutionary conversations entailed and the, you know, diversity of perspectives including among communities of people who would self-identify as Catholic and people who would self-identify as revolutionaries and some people who would self-identify as, as both. Um, but as, as we know, and as I think Nikki Sanders has said in, in earlier gatherings, there are some parts that among this group, we can just skip, you know, this is Mexico, this is what happened in 1917, <laughs> um, those kinds of, of prefaces and they're, you know, I presented this paper at another conference where I did have to explain that. So cutting that back, um, any advice about that would be a good, um, uh, very much appreciated. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah, the time period that I focus on is after the Cristiada um, in a time and space when the ability for men, uh, both members of the clergy and even laymen was you know, pretty strictly, um, or um, pardon me, um, depending where you were, uh, pretty uh, limited um, from inconvenience to worries of personal safety, um, you know, how much one could act openly and publicly in, in favor of Catholic practice, um, you know, uh, 
was that much more difficult. Whereas because of cultural expectations, um, as well as a lot of organizing, and again, there's been some wonderful work done recently on antecedents to the time period of this paper that I'm really looking forward to citing more and integrating more into my work. Um, and especially since that's a work in progress, if you have recommendations for sources, authors to include in this paper, those suggestions would be very welcome as well. Uh, but yeah, building on antecedents of women's active participation <laughs> in their communities in support of their religious practice, in many ways, not surprisingly, it is uh, women um, who respond um, to calls to counter uh, various, um, you know, state-led um, projects in their communities. And in this presentation, I concentrate on um, attention paid to um, schooling and the renewed efforts to open public schools and have people attend public schools after the Cristero Rebellion, that violence is, is diminishing. Um, a case study in my dissertation focuses on the Archdiocese of Guadalajara, which roughly corresponds to the state of Jalisco. Um, although, and this is one attempt to illustrate it. Some parishes and municipalities are in the state of Zacatecas. Um, a few are in the state of Nayarit, although the, Arch the Archdiocese of Guadalajara and the, you know, the diocese in the center borders the, the diocese of Nayarit. Um, there is a Vicaria de Outland, which is going to become a separate diocese fairly soon, the Diocese of Colima in the south. Um, but anyway, more or less, there's a lot of crossover between uh, documentation from the state of Jalisco and the Archdiocese of Guadalajara and when and where I could <laughs> I tried to match up documentation from state and church uh, sources from, from other locations. But anyway, in this in this paper, um, sort of pulling out some of the case studies from dissertation work a long time ago and then having um, some really good experiences uh, returning to the um, Arch, um, the historic archive of the Archdiocese of Guadalajara, which reopened in the early 2000s and has become a very researcher friendly place, <laughs> a great place to work. Um, um, and I gained access to some very detailed local reports, um, both you know, informes sent in month by month or sometimes sporadically, you know, but they're meant to be monthly, from comites parochiales, from the various um, parochial uh, committees of Catholic action groups, um, as usual, <laughs> the preponderance of the vast majority of documentation are from the older women, the Union Femenina Católica Mexicana, and the younger women, the Juventud um, you know, uh, Católica Femenina Mexicana. Um, and there are some compilations, uh, including two reports, uh, one on Catholic schools in the cities by Rosa Cisneros and one Catholic schools outside of the city of Guadalajara by Rafael Regalado. And those helped sort of guide my um, inquiries into just, again, trying to figure out what was going on in these communities, who was kind of pushing back against um, state-sponsored educational programs, and what really happened. There's a lot of hyperbole um, and narratives that sort of stretch from the Cristiada into the 1930s of escuelas clandestinas and people meeting in homes and being worried about their houses being seized and um, Catholic teachers, you know, going from home to home or classes switching location. Um, and it's not that there's no truth value to these, but trying to get a sense of how many students actually attended those schools, how many students were still going to public school, what, what were parents and children trying to do as they tried to weigh these decisions? Do we try to gain some education, but are we running against the recommendations of, of the diocese? Can we ask for an exemption? Um, what kinds of choices uh, were they making? And who were they meeting in their, their communities? It does seem like the Union Femenina Católica Mexicana took over the task of trying to influence local school teachers and members of their community um, to either accept or not accept, um, you know, public education or any kind of education uh, along certain um, ideological uh, lines and to make their decisions um, accordingly. And so, yes, how much of an impact do they have? How many people's like, schooling did they actually change or like, what what did they change? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to put your finger on sometimes. There are reports at annual conferences and, and meetings and get a lot of claims made, but getting more of a sense of what's going on on the ground is, is what I'm uh, really interested in. When doing that, you know, one begins to find, you know, some cross references of 
towns, if not of individuals. I want to take very seriously um, in incidents that were going on in the region in the 1920s and continuing in the 1930s, you know, concerns with and actual events of violence that were ideologically motivated, religiously motivated. You know, broad assumptions have been made <laughs> in, in earlier historiography um, and even in, in more recent work and disturbingly, um, you know, finding that some communities are ringing their church bells or in the name of, of um, their church and, and the Catholic religion are attacking school teachers, are vandalizing and destroying properties. Those incidents are all very real, but are they the exact same people, you know, doing it all the time? How can you differentiate, um, you know, Catholic activists who did not intend to use violence or property destruction from those who did, rather than assume things were entirely, on the one hand, entirely or always violent or entirely or the other hand, um, heroic and um, peaceful, which they weren't. Um, so that is a concern, a very deep concern of mine and how to represent that most authentically and in the most um, helpful <laughs> and nuanced way is, is something that I'm continuing to, to work with. Okay, we can skip this part, <laughs> um, which is nice. Except I want to to give a note of appreciation. I think he's attended a meeting or two of this, but reading um, Jose Luis Lopez Ulloa's work on Los Altos, I finally figured out something that I've been wondering about um, in, in my earlier work, um, reading documents from the 1930s and including some of this documentation from the monthly informes, you know, both women writing in from their communities and the the more comprehensive reports referred to like a system of licencia um, and even it's mentioned in the 1938, the documents from the 1938 Synod of the Archdiocese of Guadalajara, that there are teachers working with licencia and the diocese is making sure that teachers are licensed um, appropriately. And I'm like, what the heck is this? <laughs> um, and turns out um, these were this was a, a system that was publicized in the Boletin Ecclesiastico de Guadalajara um, kind of prior to the... Um, expansion of, of tensions in, 19, in 1926, pardon me, it was in December 1925, that the Archdiocese of Guadalajara pretty much indicated that this was originally going to be under the supervision of parish priests, that it would be made clear uh, whether public school teachers um, were, were kind of cleared, <laughs> I don't know how best to translate this, but approved of by uh, the local religious authorities, if they could be trusted, you know, not to impart um, you know, dangerous or offensive uh, curricula to to students, and that if this were the case, then um, it was more permissible for parents to send their children to the local school if the teachers were not um, given or if licencia wasn't indicated for them, uh, then parents were expected to keep their children you know, out of the schools. The very next year, the rebellion starts. There's a lot of there are a whole lot of reasons people aren't going to to school, but in the early 1930s, there seems to have been a return to this project of, you know, how can we um, try to assure that teachers aren't going to contravene Catholic teaching in, in the public schools, that we're going to accept them as, as members of, of our community. And the responsibility seems to have passed to the women of the Union Femenina Católica Mexicana. I don't have a single document that says that, but since committees, you know, are beginning to report in <laughs> about uh, their relationships with teachers, and especially after the reform of Article Three, the um, change of you know the education to uh, being explicitly socialist education, the comités parroquiales and the diocesan committees of the Union Femenina Católica Mexicana form school schools committees, and yeah, the the charge is, is much more explicit by that point. So it's been really interesting to find out, and if other people have perspectives on that from other parts of Mexico. Um, or from their research, I'd be really, really interested in learning and incorporating more about that. And again, and getting the sense of, of how people got things done, I'm really intrigued by the work of uh, sociologists, um, Christina Bicchieri and Eber uh, Chow, um, I think I'm pronouncing the name uh, correctly, uh, who've written about the grammar of society, how people in social interactions convince each other and also sort of create an environment of social reputation and exchange. Um, and uh, to make a very long story short, they um, tried to sort of lay it out here <laughs> as I heard it explained once at a, a conference. 
there are things that we know and there are things that other people know. Um, and it turns out that the loci of influence, you know, are sometimes where you might not expect. Um, and generally, like spreading a sense that other people are going to know about what people in the community are doing, it sounds very removed and remote. But Bikiri and Xiao have both run sort of social science, you know, lab experiments, and also used other um, you know, kinds of, of research to indicate that um, there is a power in spreading a sense of you know, a community uh, understanding or, you know, broader, you know, social standard um, and people's work to sort of control and reclaim this social standard um, can do much to, to influence um, public opinion and individual actions. And so, especially for the activists who do seem to have had some sort of measurable impact in their communities, where I don't find cross-references of incidents of physical violence or teachers being run out of town and, and also just like reports of, hey, <laughs> that they inform me and say, we're working very well with the local teachers or sometimes every now and then finding reports from public, um, the Secretaria de Educación Pública or, um, or, or some documents from the National Archives where there are complaints like, ah, you know, the school teachers are in league with the local Catholics. <laughs> um, so I, I, I want to keep exploring how social interactions like this, you know, can be at work. But that's also not to deny that, again, the threats of violence and incidents of violence were, were very real. Um, so I want to continue to take these works seriously. I haven't worked in the, the archives of the Secretaria de Educación Pública as extensively as I would have liked to. I haven't been there for a long time. Um, so if people have information on how it's organized or how to find out more about tensions with local Catholic activists, um, you know, in the education archives, I'd love to hear about that. I realize time is, is running on. Um, I think it's very interesting to analyze these from a gendered perspective, because both from the Catholic side and, you know, the non-Catholic aligned public side, uh, these the actions of women activists are are taken to be transgressives in ways that really interestingly echo what Mary Kay Vaughan and others have found the ways in which female teachers in particular were sort of focused on as violating um, social norms, stepping outside um, their place. Indeed, in the 1938 uh, Sinodo de, de um, you know, documents, um, Gary Rivera indicates kind of clearly that like things are coming down it's time for women to sort of return to their more normal activities and kind of back away from extraordinary measures that needed to be taken during periods of a greater conflict. Um, and that's echoed too in some complaints, as I said before, from communities members, some of whom were protesting like these women are influencing the teachers, but we are padres de familia. And I think that was used in a intentionally gendered you know, way. Like we as male authors, um, you know, should be deciding what our children learn. It's a very interesting dynamic in some of the documents. Uh, and so, you know, to, to begin to sum up, uh, the Guadalajara, the diocesan committee was the third largest in the nation. And I've been trying to work with um, just some mapping, um, assuming that parish boundaries and municipal boundaries are at least somewhat similar or mapped to each other. Um, and you can see, you know, it's definitely there is a lot of strength in the city of Guadalajara and in the larger towns and cities in Los Altos. But there's a bit of distribution, at least among the documents that are left um, across much of the diocese. Um, you know, um, the representation isn't great, depending on what year you're looking at. You may only have reports from like 25 to 30 percent of the parishes are reporting in. But there's some geographic um, distribution across uh, the diocese. Um, and right, it's not all in Los Altos. It's not all in Guadalajara. Um, you find some you know, big chapters. This is Thomas Ula in the south, um, supposedly an area, and really an area of a lot of agrarista organizing, but also some Catholic counter organizing. Um, so when one can find this information, it gives you a sense of the very complex dynamics going on in communities and the ways that activists, many of them women, were mobilizing Catholics. So by the, toward the end of the decade, with those reports that I was looking at, um, out of a, a, the list that I counted in the Synod documents, there are 116 parishes, 
in the diocese of Guadalajara, the center of the archdiocese. Um, there are active homeschools in 23 of them. So that's what, like a fifth. It's not huge, but it's not insignificant. And other clandestine schools in another quarter of the parishes, um, small but interesting number, are still carrying out school strikes. And this, um, you know, the mention of these teachers who are considered to have licencia and are following normas, um, you know, 44 out of 116 uh, parishes, a little over a third. Um, so the actions of some <laughs> Catholic activists that we know about from the documentation are, are bearing fruit. In terms of how many children went to these schools, I think that as far as we know, the quantity of children going to clandestine schools or, or somehow opting into alternative Catholic education of sorts, that was like perceptible, noticeable, but still not huge. <laughs> not a majority of, of school age students by any stretch of the imagination. And how many children really accessed alternative Catholic education despite attention paid to it in um, you know many reuniones, uh, you know, or like annual or, or biennial, um, you know, parish um, uh, programs, uh, parish assembly programs, etc., and in the diocesan assemblies, you know, a lot of mention is made of the need for escuelas hogar, but how many people are actually going to them is, is really hard to put a finger on, and I suspect it was very small. Some people were able to go to school in a way that was sort of comfortable, aligned with religious practice. Some parents did ask, you know, their, their parish priests, you know, can we please send our children to school? We, economically, we have no other alternative. There's scant documentation of that, but the petitions are really interesting to look at. And I think, you know, knowing both from oral history and other sources, a lot of people just didn't go to school at this time, which is another sobering reality to take into um, consideration. And there are anecdotal reports, you know, from this community or that community or some oral history, you know, things like that of the ways that people worked out their own individual decisions and compromises, some of which felt very comfortable in terms of religious belief and sort of striking community agreement and others which were not as, as comfortable or that could be downright, you know, again, um, unpleasant or result in deprivation or, or violence. So how to represent this the kind of multiplicity of history is effectively is, is something that I'm still working on and will welcome suggestions about. So on that note, <laughs> I thank you for reading through what is, what is still very much a draft. Um, I welcome your comments and uh, suggestions. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Christina. That was great. Thank you. Very exciting stuff. Uh, we're going to try, vamos a intentar a ver si ahora eh, Divina puede volver a conectarse y a compartir pantalla para terminar con su ponencia. ¿Estás ahí? Y estaba mandando mensajes hace un minuto. Uh -huh. Vamos a dar un minuto. Aquí está, pero tiene problemas con el audio. Es que me dice. Muy bien. Podemos ver tu imagen, podemos ver la pantalla, pero no, no escuchamos. No sé si estás hablando o no. Y todavía no se, no se escucha. Pues me dice que él no puede conectar al área. Uf. No sé si hay otra manera. Pues. No sé, no sé si, si estabas usando un micrófono eh, o si es el audio de tu computadora. Yo creo Porque que. Puede... Oh, pero adelante. No, es que pudimos escucharte muy bien al principio del, del sí. evento. 
Tal vez Estoy bien. audífonos, a lo mejor te está fallando. No sé. ¿Audífonos? Ajá, no sé si tiene, igual los puede desconectar y tal vez así funcione. Estoy pensando también. Ajá. Estoy pensando también que ella uh, puede usar su teléfono. Como, ah, también, claro, como micrófono. Para la voz. Puedes, puedes entrar a la llamada por teléfono. Uh -huh. Las mañas que uno aprendió durante COVID, ¿no? Pues sí. <ríe> eh, divina, ¿qué quieres hacer? ¿Quieres intentar eh, llamar por teléfono o quieres que... De todas maneras, Elizabeth tiene un comentario para tu, para tu trabajo también, como tú, como tú prefieras. Ella me, dijo que, ella me dijo que sí lo intentó por ser y no está funcionando tampoco. Uf. Entonces, yo creo, Ricardo, que seguimos con los comentarios de Elizabeth. Uh, sí, Cristina, ¿vas a añadir algo? ¿Vas a sugerir algo? Sí, la otra cosa que me pregunté era si ella podía enviar a alguien más su presentación y just speak. Like maybe we could advance her slides o um, one of the co-hosts. Sí, yeah, I mean, if, running the two yeah. things is very difficult. If she could send it, well, by email. Um, yeah. That's just It, another idea that perhaps would free up some of her bandwidth. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Divina, si, si nos envías tu ponencia, o sea, ¿tu audio está funcionando o, o es un, pro, un problema de audio en la computadora? Porque lo que puedes hacer es enviarnos a nosotros tu ponencia y nosotros la podemos proyectar y tú nos guías con el audio, con tu micrófono. Pero para que eso funcione, tenemos que asegurarnos que sea, que tu micrófono esté funcionando. Porque si el micrófono no sirve, entonces ese es, es ese problema que no, no podemos solucionar. Voy a suceder algo muy de señora. Y si se sale de la sesión y entra de nuevo, tal vez se ocurra la magia. Y se, re, se reinicia el micro y la cámara, ¿no? Sí, sí, ya, ya he entrado como cinco veces. No. <ríe> sí, no, bueno. ya, la hemos, ya la hemos visto entrar y salir como seis veces de la, de la reunión. Um, Uy, pues Deborah me, me mandó un mensaje que dice que su laptop es el problema y pues va a, ver, va a enviar su presentación. Ok. Eh, ya, ya no está en el chat, se, se desconectó. Ya no, está en, ya no está en el Zoom. Sí, tienes razón. Um, let's just, ¿Por qué no seguimos con los comentarios? Y lo que podemos hacer es, este, luego podemos hablar con ella si quiere hacer, eh, reunir, eh, integrarse a otra sesión. Podemos buscar una manera de, de, de que ella encaje con otra sesión. Y también podemos, si quiere, podemos compartir su, algo que tenga, o sea, aparte del texto, si quiere compartir sus, sus PowerPoints o algo así. Eh, pero bueno, eh, sí. el, el show debe continuar, ¿no? Entonces, este, Eli, si quieres eh, nada más limitarte a los comentarios que tienes hacia Cristina eh, y ya de ahí empezaremos a dialogar este súper interesante trabajo. Eh, eh, pero bueno, te voy a dar una, voy a presentarte primero. Eh, la doctora Elizabeth Sejudo Ramos, es profesora del Departamento de Historia y Antropología de la Universidad de Sonora. Es integrante del Sistema Nacional de Investigadores Nivel 1. Integrante del Comité Directivo de la Red de Estudios de Historia de las Mujeres y de Género en México, Red Mujer. Y coorganizadora de la Red Iberoamericana de Historiadoras. Es integrante de la Red de Historiadores del Catolicismo en México y del Seminario Permanente de la Historia Contemporánea y del Tiempo Presente en México. Es integrante de la Comisión de Género, Diversidad e Inclusión Social de la División de Ciencias Sociales en la Unison. Es doctora en Historia por la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, maestra en Ciencias Sociales con especialidad en Métodos de Investigación Histórica por el Colegio de Sonora y licenciada en Comunicación por la Universidad de Sonora. Es autora de libros como Mujer, Periodismo y Opinión Pública en Sonora, El caso de los Periódicos del Pueblo y el Tiempo de Hermosillo, 1934-38, eh, al igual que El Gobierno no puede más que Dios, Género, Ciudadanía y Conflicto, Iglesia-Estado en el Sonora Postrevolucionario. 
Adelante, Mieli, te escuchamos. Muchas gracias, Ricardo. Eh, y gracias por, por la invitación a comentar estos trabajos. Eh, ya, ya le pasaré mis comentarios a Débora. Me da mucho gusto que siga trabajando con el tema y espero que... Creo que tiene un, un trabajo con mucho potencial que, que va a ir creciendo poco a poco, ¿no? Bueno, Cristina, mmm, voy a platicar un poco del lugar desde donde, desde donde voy a anunciar mis comentarios. Eh, tu trabajo eh, fue como, eh, ha servido de mucha inspiración para el mío. Eh, y cuando yo empiezo a buscar eh, información referente a, a preguntas generales que tenía, eh, leerte siempre fue como muy útil para poder guiarme y para poder saber más o menos eh, cómo estructurar de manera más clara lo que quería yo hacer. Y la otra, mi, otro, mi, otro, mi otra condición de enunciación es que Digamos que lo que yo he estudiado en los últimos años de mi vida se parece mucho a lo que tú estás presentando acá, eh, en, en, digamos, en, a, al menos temporalmente. Y muchas de las ideas que mencionas me volaron la cabeza porque dije, ¿por qué no las pensé? ¿Cómo no se me ocurrió? Y, y creo que, digamos, lo que, quizá lo que te vaya a decir tiene mucho que ver con la experiencia que yo ya reconozco de acá y que tal vez estoy haciendo comparaciones, ¿no? Entonces, que, que posiblemente nos ayuden a conversar un poco más, ¿no? Bueno, como ustedes ya vieron, el trabajo de Cristina atiende al trabajo, eh, atiende a, digamos, al trabajo de base desarrollado por mujeres católicas a través de campañas educativas y monitoreo comunitario en la diócesis de Guadalajara entre el 34 y el 40. Un periodo también de conflicto entre la Iglesia Católica y el Estado postrevolucionario. Y esta es una de las cosas que que encuentro primero de gran valor de su trabajo. Eh, eh, creo que mmm, la idea de estudiar o de ver más allá de la cristiada, ¿no? Yo creo que hay, eh, hay que empezar como a, a ponerle quizá otro nombre. Algunos hablan de tercera ola anticlerical, por ejemplo, y demás. Eh, pero creo que es bien importante que, que empiecen a surgir más y más trabajos que nos ayuden a explicar este periodo súper convulso también para el catolicismo mexicano, y que de pronto aparece eh, como algo residual, ¿no? Incluso se le llama la segunda en algunas ocasiones, y creo que es bien importante que trabajos como este nos invitan a ver pues, más allá de este, de este periodo, de este conflicto armado, y ver que eh, lo que ocurre durante la década de los 30, si bien por supuesto, por supuesto está relacionado ¿no? con estas políticas anticlericales de los gobiernos correvolucionarios, tienen como su propia dinámica, ¿no? Tienen sus propias causas, actores, ejercicios, ¿no? Y vamos a ver expresado, me parece a mí, algo que Matthew Butler llama como el crecimiento del laico ¿no? dentro de la iglesia, en la que van adquiriendo experiencias de la primera ola, de la segunda ola, y que yo creo que vemos expresadas con mucha inteligencia por parte de la estructura católica durante la década de los 30, ¿no? O sea, la práctica hace al maestro, en este caso a las maestras, este, porque van aprendiendo diferentes estrategias en movilizaciones previas y creo que en los 30 se expresan con muchísima claridad. Yo veo en tu trabajo, como siempre, un riguroso, crítico y creativo análisis de fuentes. Eh, me gusta mucho lo que, lo que hiciste con los mapas. Eh, creo que es algo que todas las que estudiamos católicas organizadas deberíamos hacer, y todos, porque, eh, digamos, expresan de forma muy clara el orden que tenían para organizarse y la cobertura que tenían eh, geográfica, ¿no? Que eso es bien importante, porque no solamente es hacer un trabajo en corto, sino que se desplegaban de manera hiperorganizada, y los mapas que nos estás mostrando en la presentación ahorita y de los que nos platicas en el trabajo, creo que dan cuenta de manera muy clara de, de realmente el nivel de efectividad que tenían estas actividades de mujeres católicas, y eh, la forma tan clara de organizarse y tan... Eh, que se ve, se ve finalmente en los resultados, ¿no? Eh, bueno, finalmente, eh, la gran pregunta es, ¿no? Si, ¿Cuál fue el impacto que tuvieron las mujeres católicas en este, eh, en, en este periodo, particularmente te enfocas en las, en, las, este, en las políticas educativas emanadas del artículo tercero de esta modificación que se da en 1934? Eh, y te preguntas también, que es algo que, que parecería lógico, pero no lo es, ¿no? Porque nada es completamente lógico ni natural. ¿Cómo el problema educativo se convirtió en un problema de las mujeres? Y aquí es, un, es una gran primera pregunta de género, ¿no? ¿Por qué lo asumen eh, como suyo? ¿O ¿Por qué se asigna a las mujeres el problema educativo como básicamente de ellas, no? 
Eh, yo creo que es una cuestión central, ¿no? O sea, eh, son disposiciones de la propia jerarquía eclesiástica, son modelos normativos, ¿no? Esta extrapolación de la madre social y cómo eh, la educación forma parte, ¿no? De este abrazo materno que dan las mujeres a la sociedad, o es una agencia específica de la Unión Femenina Católica eh, Mexicana, ¿no? Eh, esa creo que es una pregunta bien importante. Yo lo que he visto en documentación, digamos, en general sobre, el, sobre las campañas contra la educación socialista, es que la jerarquía eclesiástica son llamadas las madres de familia, no tanto los padres de familia, ¿no? Porque, bueno, finalmente estos modelos son como, eh, la, 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 la mujer sigue siendo el ángel del hogar y sigue siendo la que se encarga del cuidado de las criaturas, entonces pues eh, eh, son, son ellas quienes deben de hacerse cargo de la educación y de defenderles, ¿no?, de cualquier cosa que atente contra su formación religiosa. Entonces, eh, creo que de entrada esa, esa pregunta parecería este, como, como básica, pero me parece súper, súper importante que la, que, que la hagas, porque nos hace pensar eh, no solamente en los por qué, sino en los cómo, como nos decía John Scott, ¿no? Se sabe que la jerarquía eclesiástica prohibió sus peligrosas la asistencia a escuelas públicas o riesgo de excomunión, ¿no?, eso, eso está claro y que los padres pues eh, tenían, tenían como de dos sopas, ¿no? O abrazar la fe y dejar a sus hijos en la escuela o este, pues mandarlos a la escuela bajo el riesgo y con determinadas justificaciones, ¿no? Tú nos explicas que los padres seguían enviando a sus hijos a las escuelas, así que las mujeres de la UFCM intervenían de dos formas, instalando una suerte de vigilancia, monitoreo, que era un casi servicio de inteligencia porque estaban haciendo reportes, ¿no? De qué es lo que estaba pasando en el campo finalmente y que se me hace súper interesante que lo relaciones con esta eh, propuesta de la gramática de la sociedad, que creo que es súper útil para explicar lo que nos estás diciendo. Y además negociaban con actores estatales, o sea, los profesores. Y a mí me parece que esta, esta conexión o este vínculo que se da entre los maestros, las maestras y madres de familia que ocurre en todo el país, es algo que se tiene que estudiar eh, como con mayor detenimiento, porque eh, eran actores bien importantes los profesores, no solamente en las aulas, sino que eran actores que interactuaban en la comunidad y eran influencia bien importante para la comunidad. Entonces, el tener como cierto, eh, cierta relación o cierta interacción con ellos eh, abre como muchas posibilidades de interpretación eh, de lo no tan sólido o no tan cerrado que era este estado de noción postrevolucionario, ¿no? Eh, y, y, esto, y con esto voy a lo que sigue, ¿no? O sea, ni la iglesia ni el Estado tenían un control absoluto sobre sus actores. Y trabajos como el tuyo dan cuenta de eso, ¿no? De manera así bien clara. Son instituciones no, no monolíticas, eh, son heterogéneas y con problemas claros para establecer su consolidación. O sea, la iglesia tenía pocos años de haber firmado los arreglos. El Estado nació un postrevolucionario y siempre estaba en conflicto, ¿no? La familia revolucionaria es muy disfuncional y siempre estaban como que reacomodándose constantemente, entonces era imposible mantener un control sobre, sobre todos sus actores, ¿no? Los, los propios estatutos del PNR decían, nadie de los, eh, de los eh, PNRistas puede practicar algún culto religioso y aún así lo hacían, pues, ¿no? Y, y viceversa. Eh, entonces creo que, que tu trabajo da cuenta como de esa, ¿no? Estos espacios de no control eh, son aprovechados para la acción colectiva, para las agencias que no necesariamente confrontan, como bien lo dices, pero que son efectivas para mantener la espiritualidad en regla y desgastar las medidas anticlericales, que es algo eh, que yo observé en Sonora eh, después de haberte leído, ¿no? Y de haber, de, de haber reparado en estos eh, eh, espacios privados que se van convirtiendo en públicos porque se ofrecen para el resto y demás, ¿no? Y, y mi duda es esta, ¿no? Sobre los mecanismos, mecanismos de vigilancia y control por parte del Estado, ¿no? Eh, por ejemplo, en Sonora se multaba a los padres de familia que no llevaban a sus hijos, eh, incluso algunos tuvieron como algunos pe pequeños periodos de horas, ¿no?, de encarcelamiento, había como mucho empeño eh, por parte del Estado por vigilar que efectivamente fueran a las iglesias, digo, perdón, a las escuelas, y además estaba prohibido el catecismo, entonces no se podía impartir bajo ninguna circunstancia. Mi pregunta es, ¿qué pasaba en, en Jalisco, no? Si realmente el Estado tenía un control o un interés así como tan claro por, eh, para vigilar que efectivamente estuvieran yendo las infancias a la escuela. Esto me lleva a pensar en, en quizá que podría ayudarnos a ver un poco más de la dinámica política local, ¿no? Porque así podríamos, digo, nos explicas, por ejemplo, que en la primera ola anticlerical se creó un espacio de negociación y que, y que hubo, pues se dieron a las autoridades ante las exigencias de la comunidad católica, 
pues me gustaría saber cómo qué pasaba en los 34, 40, ¿no? Si eran, eran gobiernos más permisivos, eran facciones que tenían menor conflicto con la iglesia, mayor, etcétera, etcétera, ¿no? Igualmente, digamos, a nivel nacional, el cardenismo, si bien impulsa la educación socialista en 1934, le va bajando, ¿no? Conforme pasan los años. Y para 1938, en realidad, la cosa era muy conciliadora, ¿no? Y, y el propio catolicismo lo aprovecha para negociar o para, o para trabajar de, eh, con autoridades que a lo mejor ya no estaban tan involucradas en las medidas anticlericales. Entonces, quizás estaría bueno también como agregar ese, ese, esa capa, digamos, al análisis o, o para ver si efectivamente se van eh, haciendo más permitivas las autoridades o mantenemos como la misma, el mismo nivel desde 34 al 40, 38, ¿no? Mm. Creo que me gusta mucho la, la noción de, de Power con respecto a las estrategias de las mujeres de derechas como un elemento de explicación para, para decir, bueno, ¿por qué nos involucraron en acciones violentas las mujeres? ¿no? Eh, te quería preguntar si tenías como otras ideas con respecto a por qué las mujeres que tú identificas en la UFCM no estaban involucradas en estos, generalmente eran como linchamientos a profesores rurales, ¿no? a profesores de la escuela socialista, que no sé si era porque estaban en entornos como más urbanos o, o si había diferencia entre las de los entornos urbanos o rurales o qué pasaba ahí, ¿no? O si finalmente es una expresión de la, una lección aprendida de la cristiada, ¿no? A lo mejor el camino eh, más exitoso es algo más sutil, es algo menos confrontativo, no sé. Eh, y en cuanto a la estructura jerárquica, ¿no? Siempre se habla de esto, de qué tanta agencia tenían las mujeres. Eh, con respecto a, a lo que estaban haciendo, eh, si estaban adheridas, organizadas con la jerarquía eclesiástica, ¿no? Mm, mi pregunta es más o menos si, si, si notabas que había como una obediencia, por llamarlo de alguna forma, o había capacidad de generar como estrategias propias, y luego también cómo funcionaba la estructura jerárquica dentro de la organización y se permitía a sus actoras como algo de libertad, o estas dos estrategias que estamos viendo, eh, que es hablar con los maestros, este, este monitoreo social que estaba como dirigido por las, eh, por las, eh, por quienes estaban más arriba, ¿no? En el espacio jerárquico y en, el, en la división jerárquica. Eh, me llama mucho la atención algo que a ti también te llama mucho la atención, que es la escasa mención al catecismo. Eh, que acá en Sonora, por ejemplo, fue utilizado como una forma de contrarrestar la escuela socialista pero el catecismo era prohibido también, entonces se convertían en escuelitas eh, clandestinas. Eh, me, me llama la atención eh, qué pasaría en estas escuelas clandestinas de las que nos hablabas en el, en el mapa anterior, si serían escuelas en las que se veía todo el contenido de clases o solamente eran escuelas en donde se practicaba el catecismo, eh, o cómo funcionaban, ¿no? porque sí se me hace muy curioso que no se mencionen. Eh, y bueno, eh, también tengo otras preguntas, ¿no? Sobre si, si identificaste como algunas de estas mujeres de la UFCM en asustando o participando en alguna actividad violenta, más allá de, de estas dos que identificaste, si ellas leían o tenían como una publicación que les construía discursos públicos que ayudaba como a configurar estas, estas estrategias. Y la diócesis de Jalisco, en lo que tú conoces, también contaba como otros lugares, por ejemplo, Baja California, Sonora, Chihuahua, con, el, con una iglesia feminizada, ¿no? Una iglesia que estaba como sostenida en su mayoría por mujeres, o si había más participación de los varones, ¿no? Y, y bueno, eh, cierra diciendo que las ideas en el mundo católico, sobre, incluyendo las ideas de género, van evolucionando, ¿no? Y, y me gustaría saber qué conoces después. De, de qué pasa este conflicto, ¿no? ¿Qué pasa con estas mujeres? Y si identificas como si hay como un aprendizaje, una reorganización, o las cosas continúan eh, como eran antes de que tuvieran que tomar postura eh, pública, digo, política, y transgredir esos roles de género y regresan a la normalidad, o si, o si se quedan eh, con algunos elementos ahí aprendidos, ¿no? Estos serían mis comentarios. Disfruté mucho leyendo tu trabajo. Muchas gracias por seguir con el tema. Muchas gracias, Eli. Adelante, Cristina. Uh, if you'd like to respond in English, that's totally fine too. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I want to leave as much time as possible to hopefully hear from Divina again and to respond to other questions. So I'll just say thank you very much for those many, many good <laughs> suggestions. Um, 
and and yeah, sort of contextualizing more like what was going on in the church. It has a repu or in, in in Jalisco and Guadalajara has a reputation for being the gallinera de la nación, but there were church closures. There was a limited number of priests, and how and where that was renegotiated that could be very important to weave into. It is very important to weave into again the the narratives from the different uh, localities. So that is that is a very good um, suggestion. wasn't as easy as some people assume in, in a lot of places in in Jalisco. So again, that's really important. And again, I'll just tip my hat to another author, um, Maria Teresa Fernandez Aceves. I'm sure many of you are familiar with her work, which is well, multiple very wonderful pieces of writing. But one article where she contrasts, compares, and contrasts oral histories of two teachers, one very much aligned with the public education project and one who, just as, as Eli described for Sonora, um, helped start a clandestine school in the mid 1930s that gradually came, um, operated more openly as a private school and ultimately was incorporated as, as a private school once again, the informally and then formally socialist education was ended and, and also like increased um, permissiveness for, for private schools and, and even religious schools to operate more openly um, emerged in the 1940s. Uh, Julia Fernandez, who was a co-founder of the Colegio Aquiles Cernan, and the, the, the like micro cases of these two women and the systems they represented, I, I think do represent you know, as a, a bigger or a, a framework that could be you know, applied and explored more, more broadly um, as, as, yeah, who were making these, these choices. Um, and yeah, who were women, especially the Catholic women, interacting with in their communities? Was there a priest or a leader there? Was there not? Is important to distinguish, um, as well as yeah, again, what were their motivations in the first place? <laughs> you know, sort of getting back to that rather than assuming it is also a really, really good suggestion. So, thank you, muchísimas gracias. Muy bien. Eh, pues ahora vamos a abrir el foro para preguntas y respuestas. Hemos invitado a Adivina a ser parte de uno de nuestros próximos encuentros para que tenga el tiempo suficiente para, para compartir y exponer. Eh, como, nos, como queremos eh, que estos encuentros estén más o menos entre 90 minutos y esto, entonces no queremos este, excedernos del tiempo. Y también eh, sabemos que a lo mejor ya en este punto de la conversación va a ser un poco difícil reintegrar. Pero bueno, esa invitación eh, queda abierta y, y vamos a, a, a asegurarnos de que tengas esa oportunidad de, de compartir tu trabajo con nosotros y también puedas recibir los comentarios de Eli, aunque sea por manera virtual, si te los manda por email o algo así, para que tengas ese feedback. Eh, porque como bien dijo Elizabeth, eh, nos da mucho gusto ver que has continuado con este trabajo que también compartiste con nosotros el año pasado. Y, y ver cómo va evolucionando ese, ese proyecto, ¿no? Eh, pero bueno, si ahora alguien tiene preguntas para Cristina, eh, podemos abrir el, el, el foro. Pedro, adelante. Hola, eh, bueno, voy a hacer mi intervención en español porque mi inglés es muy malo, este, al menos para pronunciarlo. Bueno, antes que otra cosa, eh, me da gusto como estar acá conectado porque al igual que mencionaba Elizabeth, bueno, pues creo que tu trabajo ha sido importante para muchas personas que nos aproximamos a este periodo, a los estudios de las relaciones Estado-Iglesia, eh, al lugar que tienen sobre todo mujeres católicas eh, organizadas como mediadoras muchas veces en este conflicto. Y bueno, además de que ya eh, llevo algún rato literalmente el día de hoy conversando con Elizabeth sobre estos temas porque nos vimos a un examen eh, por la mañana. Eh, pues al final es complicado a veces no, no hacer como ciertos paralelismos de los casos que uno, los que uno ha trabajado con lo que tú nos expones. Y pensaba eh, que, que en esta quizá feminización de ciertas formas de activismo eh, católico, eh, ha, ha habido algunos casos donde, donde nos hemos encontrado que no solamente pareciera, digamos, que hay una dicotomía donde los hombres están del lado, digamos, de la revolución y adquieren estas, digamos, formas de sociabilidad más cercanas al anticlericalismo y pareciera ser que la defensa de la fe termina, digamos, siendo cosa de mujeres, sino que a veces esas tensiones se encuentran dentro de las mismas familias. Y ha habido varios casos donde nos hemos encontrado donde en una, Dios, un poco lo, 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 el examen en el que coincidíamos Elizabeth y yo hace rato, como eh, una hermana de Abelardo L. Rodríguez, 
es la fundadora de la primera congregación femenina de Baja California. Entonces, quería preguntarte si en el caso de Jalisco, lo que has estudiado, te has encontrado con este tipo de tensiones que no solamente, digamos, tienen que ver con, con, con una tensión más general en, en la sociedad, sino que a veces cuando uno se va viendo a, a ciertas dinámicas muy micro, se encuentra que en las mismas familias donde uno tiene hombres, eh, muchas veces militares o muchas veces miembros, digamos, de, de este régimen muy anticlerical, y ahí mismo hay mujeres este, que están utilizando incluso estas mismas este, eh, posiciones que tienen los hombres de su familia para tratar de jugar en favor de la iglesia. No sé si te has encontrado algo parecido, porque algo que mencionaba también Elizabeth, creo que sería interesante, eh, no, no solamente empezar a mapear ciertos estudios regionales, sino también como tratar de pensar un mapa más grande, digamos, de este conflicto en México, y ver cómo hay patrones que a lo mejor responden a ciertas regiones, pero que en otras se dan de otra manera. Eh, como siempre, un gusto leerte y escucharte. Sí, muy, muy rápido. Tengo algunas mmm, anécdotas de historia oral uh, de varias familias. Algunas uh, conocí a una mujer de Tamazula um, y dijo que su padre fue el presidente municipal y creo que él no tenía queja al final de cuentas con la religión católica, pero estaba tocando el parte, o like playing the part in many ways, like, like he as the municipal president needed to position himself as, as aligned with the government, obviously, um, but it was kind of an open secret that his wife and his daughters were involved in the Acción Católica. Um, and in some other cases, I'm going to lapse back into English, excuse me, you know, and especially the, the stories that really just kind of Mm, grab my heart of women uh, or you know, people remembering their childhood um, when I travel a little bit that I, I could have explained to people what I was researching I wound up talking to more women than men not because I didn't want to talk to men but anyway uh, so mostly women would, would tell me about their child their childhoods and the kinds of decisions that their families were were making um, and yeah sometimes if you know dad we wanted to have access to land or something. So I couldn't go to the Catholic school, you know, that would have gotten us in, in trouble. Um, you know, it was, it was a hard thing to hear. Um, so, you know, the people didn't wind up just not going to school at all. Um, or, you know, some people felt very tense or, or they indicated that there was tension in their household because they at least attended public school for a little while and their uh, mother really didn't want them to. Uh, so, so yeah, I think we do have some, some evidence from, some interviews that I did, some oral histories that other people have done, Agustin Vaca, Jose Luis um, Lopez Ullo, and, and others, that, yeah, these dramas really did play themselves out um, at the micro, micro <laughs> level. Um, and it's interesting because, um, again, the, the Catholic Church very often circles back to its patriarchal <laughs> leadership. I did a, another side project a long time ago. I wrote a paper for Lasso using only reports in the Boletín Ecclesiástico de Guadalajara um, of, you know, both sort of theoretical cases and actual cases of people worrying about like bigamy and, and who had had a civil marriage versus a church marriage and like working out all those difficulties and the um, that had happened during the Cristero Rebellion. I never got to do archival research on the marriages the same way I did. I wrote a chapter in a book that Matthew Butler edited where I, I did get to see records like that from the Mexico City archives, thanks to the wonderful archivists there. Um, but anyway, but in the Boletín Ecclesiastico de Guadalajara, both in these sort of theoretical, like that pose a question for priests to learn from, like, what if this happens in your parish? And there are a few sort of monthly questions, both in terms of kind of marriage and obeying your husband in general, and, and sometimes also dealing with, with things like, you know, sending your children to the socialist schools. Like, what do I do? Or what should a woman in my parish do if her husband wants her to disobey the laws of the Catholic Church? And you can sense this real tension in the writing, like, wow, well, you know, as a wife, you're supposed to obey your husband But you know, on the other hand, if you, you know, carry out, you know, these actions, um, you know, particularly with regard to your children, uh, you are contravening the, law, the laws of the church. And so I found that really interesting that there is this real <laughs> tension, like walking a very fine tightrope of male authority, <laughs> you know, clerical and, and lay. So um, definitely something worth pursuing. How much will we be able to generalize from you know, the pieces of evidence that we can find is a challenging question, but it is really fascinating. I think it was really 
personal in many ways for, for many, many people, um, how they were navigating um, these waters. I want to jump on that point about yeah. generalization. Yeah. Uh, because I think, uh, I, I mean, I really enjoyed this presentation and I think you're doing something very important uh, in terms of the scholarship. And as someone, you know, I'm someone who works on women in Mexico City and kind of their perceptions of the national project and what they're doing nationally and how they perceive particularly uh, places in the south, in the southeast, like Oaxaca and Campeche. And, you know, those are conversations uh, that are more in line with the work I'm doing, but it's interesting because as someone who, who does a lot of research in the Mexico City archives, it's easy for me to look at a state like Jalisco and think that it's kind of like a success story of the Union Femenina because of the large membership numbers, right? Those of us who have worked with the membership records at Ibero, like I remember the lists, right? Like you see where the UFSM is the strongest. And you see Jalisco is there, Zacatecas, uh, you know, and so on. And so I just assume, you know, that 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 they were, you know, doing pretty well in those states. And I, since I'm looking at the places where they're not as successful and asking the question, well, why is this the case? You know, it's really easy for me to generalize and think, well, they were successful in other parts of the country for whatever reasons. Um, but it seems to me like the really amazing intervention of your work is that it's really getting us to think very critically about, well, what does this look like in Jalisco on the ground? Is how successful are these campaigns, uh, if at all, right? What are some of the opposition movements that these women are coming up against? How are they relating to other Catholic groups in this particular state, right? Are they uh, in the fray? Are they not? So it's really problematizing and giving us a more complex view of what many of us might see as a success story of, of Acción Católica, right? And so I'm kind of curious where this uh, work fits in the larger project, right? If, if this is the question that you're asking about Jalisco uh, and, and more or less, like what are some of the conclusions that you're coming to, right? In terms of answering the question, well, you know, was Unión Femenina actually a successful educational movement or was it more, more talk and less action, right? Because I tend to, to think, um, you know, there was a lot of really important, ambitious projects. But when you see the stuff on the ground, sometimes it didn't really materialize too much for specific reasons, right? So I'm wondering, uh, you know, just to get your take on, like, how you're asking that question, because I do think there's a very important um, uh, intervention even among us who work on Catholic women, I think this is something that we all need to consider. Sure. <laughs> yeah, um, and and I can combine that. Uh, I see Jason's question in the chat um, as well. You know, thinking about changes in levels of activity over time. And this relates to what Eli said about you know the diminution of the. Um, you know, even depending on what you're talking about, by 1936, even the CEP was warning. Um, teachers like just don't mention the socialist education stuff, you know, and especially in areas that had already experienced, you know, violent um, attacks. And certainly uh, by the end of, of the decade, and in many ways, it's soft peddled or absent from a lot of curricula. And how much of that is attributable to people being justifiably frightened you know, versus um, uh, members of their communities more peacefully, you know, convincing them that not to. Um, I do, again, drawing out more quotes from these informes where, you know, the Catholic, the Catholic activists say like, yeah, we're getting along just great with the teachers, you know, that might inform. Um, and, and then being able to sort of create data visualizations of, of those kinds of, of comments. Again, you know, can we make a statement about the entire diocese of all the municipalities about that? I don't know. But interesting to note that there was, you know, there were multiple instances where community dialogue of some sort, um, you know, seemed to, to have a, a positive um, effect. Uh, there are a group of, or secciones de catecismo in the UFSM as, as well. And again, just some parish um, comites parroquiales report more about them than, than others. And there, I found a, a book published by the Comité Parroquia de Zapotiltic that had a tremendous amount of detail about their catechism programs. Um, and I would imagine that's true for other localities in, in Jalisco as well. Um, but again, always seeking more data, right? 
yeah, what kind of success story was it? Yeah, it's one of the largest um, chapters. There's a lot going on, but there there were more, as as Maria Teresa Fernandez Aceves notes as well. There are also people very heavily invested in, um, you know, the the Mexican um, public school <laughs> project and in more radical um, projects as well. Um, and so the, the Jalisco activists had, had enough on their plates uh, very often um, to to deal with. Um, and, and yeah, just as sort of fitting into the larger context. Um, I do think, you know, at this juncture in time, and this is a common thread in a lot of religious history, um, church ladies get things done. <laughs> I don't know how to say that in a more, you know, intellectual and nuanced fashion right now. Um, and it's it's really interesting to consider at the same time, Robert Curley's work speaks to this, this desire to like bring a greater masculinity back to the church. But the 1930s is just not the moment for that to happen. <laughs> and, and I don't know, maybe people are trying to bring it back in the Sanarchista movement and, and other manifestations. There, there's a frustration, well, the church won't let us do what we really want to do. So maybe we'll find another channel for our concerns. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting. I, my my research drops off in the early 1940s. Uh, it, it may be that many groups just found they didn't have as much to worry about anymore <laughs> or that they could focus more on pious actions. But again, I hope to hear more about Divina's developing work on the Hijas de Marias. Pious work could carry a lot of community power as well. Um, and that's, you know, an avenue that I think we need to... Um, explore more the hijas de maria and the you know in english the uh you know the societies of mary of the miraculous metal it's the same thing and so they're sort of brushed off as like oh it's you know prayer group <laughs> you know all these people like spending all this time um but yeah that that the association the motivational factor and the deep deep belief um are, are serious um elements that we need to consider in these histories as well and so, yeah, yeah, I think in some ways, a Jalisco, you know, did have a lot of a foundation to rest on, a cultural foundation to rest on, which may have contributed to a return to a more open doctrinal you know, practice a little earlier um, you know, than in other parts of Mexico and, and perhaps a little more visible than in other parts of, of Mexico. Um, but but the, the history is interesting nonetheless. It wasn't a given that um, reestablishing Catholic practice was going to be easy in these communities. Does that help answer or start to answer the question? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, certainly. I, I think uh, regional variations are very, very important to consider. Uh, it's just, for me, it's just such a fascinating case study, Jalisco, because like, for example, when I look at their indigenous literacy campaigns in, in Yucatan, in Campeche, like, they 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 don't go anywhere, right? These are kind of failed experiments in in education, right? In educational reform, in religious education, in you know, hispanizing you know folks, you know, campesinos, and so on. So it's really interesting for me to look at the other side of this and look at the places where they are, you know, very active, very numerous, uh, as you're saying, right? Where they have these foundations. Uh, because even there, of course, like it's it's not given. Like there's challenges to the work, and there's a lot of things happening. But it's just something again. Like I just in my own work, like I, I just I don't tend to look at it very often because I just assume right that there's right. there's success there, and I just right. want to focus more on like the very places where there's these glaring moments of disconnect mm. between you know what many of these folks you know from Mexico City are trying to do. And what's actually happening on the ground, you know, sometimes thousands of kilometers away and whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the very north of the state of the kind of it almost looks like a hand, you know, like reaching up. It's because of the mountains between Jalisco and Zacatecas. Um, you know, unfortunately, there were in Colotlan, um, there were several towns that, that were places where teachers were were attacked and, and killed. Um, then in another town, again, these are very rural, isolated areas in Santa Catarina, I found a complaint. Um, like I had a very hard time, and there's a very difficult archivist in the Secretaria de Educación Pública when I was working there in the early 2000s. Um, but I found like a few reports just from disparate places. I don't have a sense of the, like the totality of the region. But anyway, in in Santa Catarina, the the SEP inspector complains like 
there's this one woman and she's, I think he identified her as a member of the Hijas de Maria. And I don't know if that's just like the only name of a Catholic organization you could think of. That's a possibility. Or she was a Hija de Maria and they were organizing along those lines, right? Um, and like, we can't get anything done because she's, you know, convincing the parents not to send their their children to, to school. Um, so yeah, and, and it's like one area where there's a more of an indigenous population and, and um I know communities that sometimes the Catholic activists feel that they can't reach uh, and that the SEP was trying to pay more attention to as you know, people had been deprived historically. Um, but but yeah, the, the merit possibly, you know, if I could get back to <laughs> doing archival research in the near future and kind of pushing uh, research on the community dynamic well into the next decade because they were among the most isolated. Um, because of the language difference and the geographic isolation. It'd be interesting to keep looking into that. Thank you. ¿Hay alguien más que tenga alguna pregunta o último comentario? Bueno, pues parece que no. Uh, so, Nathan, if, if it's all right, I guess we'll just... Um, close out the session, right? Vamos a darle cierre a la sesión. Yes. Podemos agradecer a, a, a Cristina por su ponencia, por compartir su investigación con nosotros. Igual que adivina, eh, obviamente continuaremos ese diálogo y esa presentación para otro encuentro. Y una, un súper agradecimiento a Elizabeth por sus, sus comentarios también tan acertados, tan detallados. Y bueno, les invitamos a que nos, este, nos sigan en redes y también a que formen parte del próximo encuentro. En marzo tenemos varios eventos, en el 28 tenemos nuestra siguiente sesión de seminario y al día siguiente, el 29 tenemos una presentación del libro con la doctora Margaret Chowning eh, sobre mujeres católicas y la política en México, eh, promete ser un encuentro muy interesante habrá comentarios por parte de Edith Wright Rios y la doctora Sofía Crespo Reyes, entonces les invitamos a que este estrenan y, y sintonicen con nosotros esa, esa semana del 27 de marzo bueno, muchas gracias a todos. Cuídense mucho. Que estén muy bien. Buenas noches. Gracias. Buenas noches. Gracias a todos. Buenas noches. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Un placer conocerlos. Ay, un abrazo. Nos vemos. Uh -huh. Bye. Y Deborah está.